gonna live here again. To start off, I bet many of you, even the ones from Bakersfield, don't know that Buck Owen's first name was actually Alvis. You can look it up. It was Alvis Edgar Owens Jr. And you probably didn't know there's a famous English car called the Alvis. Here's a picture. Check out that logo, huh? But the best part is what the word Alvis actually means. Turns out it's a Scandinavian word that means all wise. Huh, well how about that? I wonder if Buck knew what his real first name meant. I bet his dad knew the score. So this show isn't about Alvis Buck Owens, no. And it isn't about the Alvis vintage car either, even though we will be talking quite a bit about cars. I guess you could call this an Alvis car because this is my car and my name is Mark Alvis. But that's not the most important thing. Everything is connected to everything else. I just found some notes from my college days where I had written it down. At that point, I thought that I had come up with it on my own. <laughs> well, if you look, you'll find a version by John Muir that's a slight bit older. In nature, says Mr. Muir, if you tug on one thing, you'll find it connected to everything else. If this is true, if everything is connected to everything else, then our thoughts as well as our physical reality are connected, a sort of Mobius strip of ideas. Yes, we might come up with a new twist, but the ingredients for my original idea came from somewhere. Of course, the impetus of a thought is not limited to just humans. Muir was more influenced by nature than other people. But it is the human mind that can connect all of these inputs and create new ideas, the evolution of a thought. Everything is connected to everything else. I think that when John Muir said it, he meant it in the physical sense. Water plus sun plus soil equals trees, that sort of thing. More like the way Rachel Carson wrote about how pesticides are connected to dead birds. The more we learn about science, the better we understand the connections between humans and the environment. Unfortunately, this often means finding out the consequences of something we've done after the fact, which are often bad. From too much plastic in the ocean to the decimation of honeybees. But by no means is this always the case. When we set our minds to it, we have an incredible ability to make things better for the planet and the creatures who live here. For a long time, though, and still, there are people who see the Earth simply as a resource and just here for the taking. They think that extracting stuff out of it is perfectly fine and that nature is something to be tamed and humans can do with it as they please. But that way of thinking is all but dead. Today, most people see our connections with nature in a much more symbiotic way, like the way the Native Americans have always seen the earth. People now understand we need to respect the land and take care of the earth. Here's what John Trudell said in his song, Crazy Horse. One earth, one mother. One does not sell the earth the people walk upon. We are the land. How do we sell our mother? How do we sell the stars? How do we sell the air? Several years ago, I made a map of what I call the connectosphere to illustrate how the things in our man-made world are directly connected to nature. Once we realize how interconnected everything is, our decisions become much easier as we weigh the desired outcomes against the actual and as we benefit from or suffer from the results. Here's an example. Carbon dioxide, CO2, is a greenhouse gas. The greenhouse gases in our atmosphere trap heat coming in from the sun, just like a greenhouse does. Although greenhouse gases are a natural and essential part of the atmosphere, too much CO2 results in too much trapped heat. CO2 is a byproduct of combustion. Our burning of fossil fuels creates massive amounts of CO2, which traps heat in the atmosphere. Since the oceans make up over 70% of the Earth's surface, they suck up a lot of heat. Hurricanes draw their energy from the ocean. If you think of heat as a form of energy, which it is, 
then you can see why a hotter ocean means more powerful hurricanes. So one of the things we need to do is stop burning fossil fuels. It's, it's just not really a choice. Not only do we have to stop putting CO2 into the atmosphere, we have to start taking it out. This is because most of the CO2 that we've put in is still there. It takes a very long time for it to go away on its own. If we keep on with business as usual, we are simply giving up on the future. Sorry, kids. Currently, most of our electricity is produced by burning fossil fuels of one type or another. Most of our cars and trucks run on fossil fuels. Most of our buildings are heated with fossil fuels. There are other cleaner ways, but the argument has always been, if we stop burning fossil fuels, the economy will suffer. We simply can't afford to change. In truth, if we don't change, we won't have an economy at all. Our current fossil fuel-based economy is not the only one possible. It's just the one that has evolved over time. It isn't at all inevitable. True, burning fossil fuels isn't the only source of excess CO2 in the atmosphere. We're burning other things too, like rainforests. Which is even worse, because it's not only adding CO2, but destroying one of nature's best ways of taking CO2 out. So we need to stop that too. The motivation for the unprecedented cooperation that will be required by every country and every human to deal with climate change has already been provided by the economic structures currently in place, as so many people around the world are now suffering the effects of climate change firsthand, from floods and fires to hurricanes and droughts. It will not be easy. In this country, we will have to change the way we do almost everything. But we can do it. When people are faced with a seemingly insurmountable problem, they unite. And given truth and knowledge, they will rise. Heather is a force for nature. I met her at Tap and Cellar and knew in the first minute that she would be perfect for our show. There is something infectious about how she talks and cares about wild animals. She was taking care of warthogs and elephants at the Chaffee Zoo when we recorded this. I remember at the age of eight, we went to SeaWorld and my first kiss ever was a walrus. I was eight years old and it was a love after that. Um, I have a photo of me at the age of nine on the stage of Dollywood uh, holding an Eurasian eagle owl. And so just being able to connect with those animals, to look them in the eye, to touch them, for them to touch me, that made a big impact on my life. And um, as I grew up, I definitely knew that that was something that I needed to be connected with. I needed to work in conservation. I needed to um, try to help our planet and the animals, especially in the situations that we're in today. Right now I have the pleasure of working with elephants and they're a fascinating creature as well. I've worked with uh, large felines, birds of prey, reptiles. Uh, each animal has their own unique abilities and literally their own personalities. And, one of my favorite aspects of my job is facilitating those moments where people can connect with them and the ones that they can't even touch them. It's, it's phenomenal to see that change overcome them, uh, adults and children alike. And it just takes me back full circle to that moment when it happened for me. Animals are changing their behaviors. We are not, we know that we're destroying the planet and we're not changing and animals definitely are changing their behaviors. They're changing um, their migratory routes. They're changing their reproductive cycles. They're changing so much. So animals are so much smarter and more in tune with the planet than we are. I feel we are so far removed and it's very sad. I think that um, if we can connect back to nature, if we can connect back to this planet, to animals, to plants, connect more to each other, I think that that's what it's really going to take for us to save this planet. Migratory birds are a really big animal group that is completely changing. You've got birds that are migrating south earlier, uh, just all kinds of different things like that. They're changing where they are based on the water supplies, based on their food sources that we have eradicated and wiped out. We're destroying the forest where they used to perch and home. Um, talk about animals in the sea. We don't know hardly anything about the 
life in our oceans, but those animals are, from what we do know, changing their migratory patterns. Uh, there's a wonderful organization, going back to the birds, Volpro, and uh, they're in Africa and they track vultures. And it's just very interesting to see year to year how those migratory patterns change. So many organizations in the ocean, One Ocean Diving in Hawaii that I've had the pleasure of visiting, they're doing amazing research um, with the different sharks and just the migratory patterns. So everything is changing. That was in Belize. It was on Tobacco Key, and it was, uh, yeah, what was what so I was there with my master program. So it's the largest conservation master's program in the world, and it was amazing. We go there um, with all different students we've never met, and we spend a few weeks together with a professor, and we meet with different experts in the industry, and we learn so much. And uh, we had the pleasure of staying there on the island, and every morning we would get up, and we would dive into the water and do coral reef studies, and we would track rays. Um, it was phenomenal and one morning when I woke up I went out there and I found a, a nurse shark that had been defend and I just found its torso so no tail no fins and it was just a, a really sad moment I it definitely brought me to tears so and why, uh, what, what happened there it was why hunted did, why did somebody do that I feel again that we have been so far removed from nature. I feel that humans, we put ourselves at the top of everything and we don't see the value in how we're all connected. When we all die, we all become dust and we all circle back into the nutrient cycle. We're not above anything. We're not here to control anything. Um, unfortunately though, I don't think that our values and our culture, especially here in the United States, really does that justice. I don't feel like we see that. We're, we're economy driven, you know, we're not environmentally driven, even though we need the environment to survive. We need animals for our health, right? We need, we're destroying forests, we're destroying plants, we're eradicating species before we even know how honestly they can even benefit us. Um, one of my favorite things, talking about venomous snakes. So if you've ever had a heart attack or recovered from any sort of heart illness, chances are that you've had a prescription or a drug that has come from a venomous snake. So it has saved your life. They're not evil things that are out there that are looking to harm us. We actually harm them so much more than they would ever harm us. So we're destroying the thing that we need to live and the things that will save us. And we're the only species on the planet that does that. So it's really interesting, the psychology of connecting to nature. Um, that's something I've been focusing on a lot during the semester of my schooling, is how important it is to make that connection as a child. So it is so much harder to connect adults. Uh, but I still see it happen. So one of my favorite things to do are um, training demonstrations at the zoo and to be able to connect people to my animals uh, that are under human care where they can look them in the eye, hear them, smell them, to see them really connect in that way. They don't have to go to Africa. They did it right here in California or wherever you are. You can do that in your local town and to connect to those animals. So it does happen with adults, but I don't see it happening as frequently. Um, Children are more pure, right? They haven't been kind of crushed by life. And uh, I think that children, uh, oddly enough, can be more focused, especially when you can get their attention, when you've got a giant bull elephant in front of them. Adults may be worrying about bills or what to cook for dinner, or they might be on their phone. You know, uh, a lot of times children, we can capture their attention a little bit easier, but I do see it happening with adults. And it is uh, a big joy when you can make that connection to an adult for me because of the fact that I feel like I gotta work a little bit harder for it. We're not only complicit in it, we're driving it, right? With um, fracking, with the way that we're destroying our rainforest, polluting the oceans. There's nothing on this planet that isn't untouched by our destruction. And I think that the way that that happens is we are so far removed from nature. Uh, urbanization is happening. People are moving into cities where you're not even connected to dirt. We don't know how our food even gets to us. A lot of times I think that slaughterhouses should have glass windows. We should know exactly the life of this animal. How did it get to your plate? Um, but I think a lot of that can be so overwhelming because it's like this multifaceted issue, right? There's so many things that are wrong. How can I just as one person make a difference? And I've got so many other things going on in my life that I, I can't even focus and think on that because it just becomes so overwhelming. And it just brings me back to, I think like my main point of, of connecting. And I think that we need to reinvent the ways that we connect, the ways that we connect to the planet, the ways that we connect to animals, to plants, the ways that we 
we even connect to each other. And I think when we connect, we care. And if we care, we'll protect and we can save. So I never knew I was going to be uh, really connected to warhogs, right? You think kind of dirty, stinky, it's just a pig. A lot of people look at them as food. Um, they are like giant puppy dogs. And you talk about, you know, dogs, because I feel like we've really connected uh, to that species of animals. But they have their own unique personalities. And we call their names, they come running. Oh, Zephyr, why are you so cute? They love to be scratched. They're incredibly tactile. Um, and it's really amazing to be able to introduce people to a species that they maybe didn't think would be so majestic and so full of life and personality. So I've gotten um, the wonderful opportunity to really foster that moment where people can connect to them. So I think that we need to find a way to reconnect. And when we do that, we're not only going to save the planet, we're going to save ourselves. And I think that that's why depression is on the rise, one of the reasons. That's why anxiety is on the rise. That's why all of this, we have lost that connection to the very thing that we are. We're all made of the same thing. We're all stars. And uh, I think that we forget that. So much science has gone into the study of if you see a photo of something, you can connect and you can care. Take it up a notch and you see an animal moving on a video. You see it on a movie. You see a, a cheetah hunting a gazelle in the plains of Africa. Take it even a step further and you go there and you see it, you hear it, you smell it, you feel the wind on your skin, you feel the vibration of a lion roaring over a mile away. And then even take it a step further, which a lot of zoos and aquariums allow, is for you to be able to touch it's one of our senses touch is so innate to us and so important to us but how do you get to touch a wild you know African elephant you can't go to Africa and really do that so that's why I think zoo zoological institutions and aquariums are so important because they really do facilitate that moment to where you can get up there and you could touch an elephant you could touch a warthog you can hold a bird you can get a kiss by a walrus and then uh, it can be love after that when there's love you care you connect and you want to save We've had major mass extinctions. The Permian one, uh, 250 million years ago, I believe, wiped out, what, 70% of vertebrae species, 90% of the marine mammals. It took out plants. Uh, nothing was untouched, but we all come from that. So we are all connected so closely. And those were caused by climate change. Those are caused by volcanic eruptions. We're now currently in the sixth mass extinction. And uh, this one's different because it's driven by us. So climate change to me is everything. It's, it's the number one priority that I believe should be the forefront of all of our thoughts and our actions. And uh, we created it we can change it. And I feel it's uh, just reinventing the way that we connect, reimagining the way that we connect. Maybe you ride your bike instead of driving, you know, to go have a bite to eat. Um, take shorter showers, shower with a buddy. You know? <laughs> so look up environmentally friendly um, clothing lines, look up environmentally friendly products, you know, use reusable water bottles, get rid of plastic. Um, also, we can reimagine the way that we even bury the dead. That's something I've been doing a little bit of research on, too, is how destructive cemeteries are. And they're not allowing our bodies to go back into the nutrient cycle. So talk to your loved ones about that. Become a tree pod. Get put into the coral reef systems. Um, they're doing these really cool new things called like conservation graveyards and uh, essentially there's no markers and you just get buried into the actual earth with just a shroud on you and it allows trees to come up and then since bodies are also um, buried there it's also a protected environment so that's something that I'm wanting to focus a little bit of my research on. Yeah, I definitely like to hope so. I think people that visit national parks, people that want to go to zoos and aquariums, um, I think they're driven there to connect because they do maybe have a passion. Um, I think there's some that probably want to come just for the selfie or, you know, things like that, um, just to see some animals get in and get out. Uh, but every single day we have the opportunity to learn, especially when you go to a zoo or an aquarium, you get out in our national parks. Uh, so I feel like that maybe those people are a little bit more inclined uh, to be uh, open to that connection. And then hopefully after coming to the zoo, they'll meet somebody like me and uh, they'll learn some facts. They'll meet an elephant and they'll be more connected. Um, 
and then they'll want to learn more because you can learn on your own technology nowadays. Uh, we can Google climate change, we can Google anything, and we can learn so much more about it and spark a passion. But that's what I hope to do when people come and visit me. And I think that if we all can see in our own backyard, have a sense of pride about that, have a sense of pride uh, where you live, the native flora and fauna that exists there, and have pride and want to protect it as well. So I think that this community really understands that. We need to change the way that we educate. Uh, I think if anything 2020 has brought to light, so much needs to be changed. We are so focused, our values and our culture and our beliefs are so intertwined with the economy. And I feel like we need to get back to conservation, to nature, to climate change, to what we really need to survive. So I think on a limited basis, children understand that, but I think that it's all varied on what their parents have taught them, what documentaries maybe they've watched, uh, who their influencers are. And that's what I think is really important as well. We need our influencers to be people like scientists, people like you. For me, I'm one of those people that I, I always want to progress. I always want to evolve. I always want to grow and change. Um, so I feel the same way about every institution. I feel like we can all do a better job of making that part of our daily conversation. There's an ease and a way to talk about stuff that can be just a general conversation. Um, it can be community related and it can really bond us and grow us together. So I've worked with organizations that go in and rescue and try to rehabilitate, but then unfortunately there's really no wild left, right, to release animals back into. So they raise the animals as ambassadors so people can connect, so people can touch. Uh, I miss working with cheetahs, definitely, going in every day and rubbing them down and hearing them purr. Just to hear that sound, uh, to connect with that, to touch them. I've worked with different organizations to help mitigate the human-wildlife conflict because we are the biggest threat, I feel like, to this planet, be it climate change or be it animals. We're the biggest threat to any of it. So there's wonderful organizations out there um, that have found that elephants are terrified of bees, believe it or not. You'd think a, a thick-skinned animal, right, wouldn't be scared of bees, uh, but they are. So wonderful organizations are building bee boxes, and they put them up on poles, and they string a wire through them, and they're all connected. So about every fifth bee box actually has a live hive in it, and they put those around the farms. So at night when the elephants come in, because maybe that's their traditional migratory route, but now a village has popped up, or maybe there's a drought, and they're just trying to live as well and they want to try to come and get the watering holes that you know the village also needs to survive there's that human wildlife conflict so the elephants try to walk in they hit the little wires the bee boxes shake and the bees um, buzz and they get all angry and they actually chase the elephants away and since elephants are so smart they actually remember and they change their migratory route we can't just ignore climate change. It's coming whether we like it or not, and we have to start changing it, or we're gonna hit that point to where there's no return and it's going to be too late, and we're close. And I think in doing that, we've, we've lost pieces of ourselves. So I think when we start to reconnect to each other, to the planet, uh, we'll find pieces of ourselves and we'll heal ourselves as we heal the planet. Definitely to me, the most important thing is, is connecting. Um, that's what I'm passionate about. That's what I hope to facilitate. Uh, wherever my future takes me with whatever career path I go on, uh, I'll always carry this dear to my heart. And uh, I want to connect to people and I want to connect people to this planet and empower people and let people know that we did this, but we can undo it. But it's going to take all of us working together and we've got to be connected for that. So yeah, connection. <laughs>
so it's pretty simple. It's kind of like putting a blanket on your house. Um, and for the most part, the more you put in, the better insulated you are. Um, the insulation is rated at something called the R value, which just means the big R stands, resist, stands for resistance to heat flow. So code is now R38 and going up. An R38 insulation would be about uh, 15 inches of blown in, which is what this is. I've, I've re-insulated my attic, I think, twice now, according to code. I don't know if you can see this, but we're now at around 18 inches or so. So that's about R49, which is going to be the new code soon. One of the things you should think about when thinking about where to spend your money to make your house more energy efficient is, you know, where can I get the biggest bang for the buck? By putting more insulation in, if you, especially if you don't have much, it's probably the best return you're going to get. The next one is windows, I would say, um, and then HVAC systems, which we'll talk about. Hot water heating, even your stove, furnace, all those things kind of add up, and we really need to address them all. This is my attic. I just came up a few minutes ago, and it's pretty warm up here. It's only May, I'd say maybe it's uh, 75 outside or so, and it's probably 100 degrees in my attic. It's a well-ventilated attic. It's not unusual for attics to get really hot. And believe it or not, in the summertime, I go up into attics all the time that are like 140 degrees. So it's really easy to see why putting a barrier between that heat, which is in your attic, and downstairs where you live is really important. So adequately insulating your attic is one of the biggest things you can do to drop your energy bill.